not. So having said that, I'd very much like to, with your permission, keep my part of this discussion as succinct as possible. And I want to stress the word discussion because I don't want to preach at you. I don't have any slides. So this isn't a presentation. This is an opportunity for all of us to connect and for me to give you valuable answers and solutions to specific challenges that you're facing. So I will tell some stories here to help illustrate some of the points that I'm gonna make, but I want this to be a discussion, okay? Secondly, with your permission, I'm going to, even without your permission, I'm gonna make a presumption that everybody inside of this room is a leader in some way, shape, or form. Now let me qualify the statement. I'm not talking about the pandering way they say that to you guys at town halls. It's like, we're all leaders. Yeah, we're all special. <laughs> no. What I mean is, very specifically, somewhere in your bubble, in your sphere of influence, you have someone that's following you. Whether you're a supervisor at work, you may have kids, you may have cats. Whatever it is that you have, in some way, shape, or form, the, the mindset that you project and the actions that you take lead other people. And that's going to be really important when we get to the end of this discussion, specifically talking about how do we help folks that are less than motivated, unmotivated, disengaged to become so. All right, you're going to find yourself in the middle of that story. All right, so out of a show of hands here, who has ever had to deal with a team where you had someone or a group of people who were unmotivated? Of course, all of us. <laughs> Right? How many of you have a kid like you versus the whole team? Do we have any of you here? Excellent. Now I need you to get really honest with this next question. All right? Not the half. I want him to see it, but I want nobody else in the room to see that I'm raising my hand. Have you ever been on a team where you're the unmotivated person? I'm going to put my hand really, really high. Okay? And it's very important that we be honest about that question because if we can't address that, you, you can forget about everybody else being part of it. Now having said that, I need to further disappoint you by saying, this talk is about how to work with an unmotivated team and I'm gonna lead with telling you, motivation isn't the problem. Motivation is not the problem you were trying to solve. Now I'm not trying to diminish, motiv diminish motivation or say that it's not important, but it's not the root cause of the problems you had when it was you against the whole team where you were working with individuals who were unmotivated. And the stories I'm gonna share with you guys and ladies today is gonna to help flesh out that point. So we're gonna do a little storytelling. I'm gonna put a little bit of science behind it because I don't wanna bore anybody to sleep with the last breakout guy. I'm gonna do a five. I think five is good, right? Not terrible? Okay, excellent. <laughs> and then we'll get to the Q and A. And to the degree that you're willing to share and comfortable with sharing, I want you to come with specific questions that are unique to your situation so that I can give the most amount of value possible. All right, so let me start the storytelling phase with a friend of mine who, technically I don't have his permission to share the story, so I'm gonna change. I'm not gonna give you times or exact places or real names. And while I tell these stories, I want you to picture yourself inside the main character. I want you to picture as I'm taking you through it that you are the person that I'm talking about. That's gonna be really important especially when we get into the science piece. I want you to picture that you are now what's called, and how many military, former military, current military do I have in the room? I just want to know how much I need to explain certain things. I want you to imagine for a second that you are now a combat medic, right? You're a person that's providing medical assistance to boots on the ground people who are actually in harm's way. Prior to having this job, you were what people from my line of work and the army call it infantrymen. Infantrymen is really just a little term for young men, but it's the guys that you see in the movies with the rifles and the hoorah stuff, right? You switch from being an infantryman to a medic because you care very deeply about taking care of other people and you've seen some of the craziness that goes on on the battlefield. Right, so that happened to a friend of mine named Chris. He was with the 75th Ranger Regiment. Some of you may know what that is. If not, has anybody seen Black Hawk Down? Those guys. Okay? And if you haven't seen Black Hawk Down, just understand this is the most elite infantry force in the United States Army. They do an airborne mission, meaning they jump out of planes onto the ground in Afghanistan 
Um, what they were going to do is not the important part. But as a combat medic, I want you to picture you're in that plane, the light's red, for anybody here who's actually jumped out of a plane. You've got all your kit, meaning all your gear, ready to go. You're, you're suited up, rifle in hand, ready to jump. Light turns green, people start jumping out of the plane. You know as a combat medic, like my friend Chris, that's what we're gonna call him anyway for the purpose of this story. You jump out of the plane, you have one job when you hit the ground. First and foremost is to make sure that everybody that hit the ground is good to go physically, okay? They're not, they run into a problem. The place where they jump into was what we call a hot LZ, or a hot landing zone. Real simple terms, they hit the ground getting shot at. People are already trying to kill them before they can even get out of their parachute. So you jump out of a plane, and a horrible parachute, by the way, that makes you question whether or not you're gonna land live, let alone get shot at. And you're praying that the private who packed the parachute doesn't hate you. That was a joke from a military folks here. But you hit the ground and immediately you go to work knowing that you're being shot at. And you come to the first person you try to help was a young guy that's on the ground. His landing didn't go well. He's injured and he's caught in his parachute while you're being shot at. My friend Chris goes to render him aid to help him get out of the chute and get him to safety so that neither one of them gets shot. The young soldier at that point pushes Chris off of him and says, get off me. Get off me. He's like, why I'm trying to help you? He's like, you're hit. And Chris is looking at himself thinking, no, not hit. My job to help. He's like, no, 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 in your face. In the melee, in the adrenaline and everything that was going on, Chris did not realize that what we call a 762 round, basically a bullet from an AK-47, went through his cheek while he was trying to help you. Okay? But the most important part of that story is Chris was shot and he was so motivated to help his people that he didn't notice it. And he was trying to help other people who weren't even in it as bad a situation as Chris was. And now I want you, like I said, imagine that that was you. Think about what motivated Chris to keep going. And especially after he shot, got shot, he didn't stop. And when he got home, he didn't get out of the military. He kept going. What was his motivation that kept him going? Anybody? Shout it out. Passion. Passion. Okay. Fair. What else? His desire to help other people. Desire to help other people. Excellent. I like the word desire. We'll come back to that. The ingrained that you leave nobody behind. Oh. You know the Ranger Creek. I don't know how to say that. Are you cheating? Are you mad? Chris is motivated in a way that many people couldn't imagine being. But I'm here to tell you, everybody in this room, with the right circumstances and conditioning, you can be just as motivated as Chris, and so can the rest of your team. And so what we're gonna be showing you today is how do we take that type of spirit back to the people on our teams and instill them with it. And yes, there is a scientific, biological and psychological way that we can do that, and I'm gonna share that with you in a minute. Let's go back in time to my college days, back shortly after the Civil War. I have to say that because it was during Civil War when we were in college. How many people in here were raised by someone from the great generation? Okay, so not the baby boomers. We're talking about the people that were alive during World War II. Okay, excellent. So, so was I. To make me not seem older than I am, Help flesh that out. Um, when I was born, I was shortly thereafter abandoned by my father, and my grandparents stepped in to raise me. Okay, so I was raised by people from the great generation. And in college, mom or grandma has a bone to pick with me. Brian, your generation is soft. In my generation, the things we used to do were way more active, way more engaged and way more profitable for the community of people than anything your generation does. By the way, I'm Generation X, in case anybody else in here is with me. Why is your generation so soft? Why aren't you marching the way that we did for the change that you want to see instead of complaining about it on the internet and tweeting about it? We had dogs sicked on us. By the way, my grandmother and grandfather we had to put together are African-American. 
add that piece of context. Live through civil rights, segregation, integration, which by the way, didn't help what we now call the black community as much as America thinks it did. You see, back then there actually was a black community and a black economy that integration actually destroyed, if you read the history. So my father and mother lived through that. And she says, you guys have no grit, you're salt. And I said, Grandma, you're right. I didn't argue with her, she's right. But the context that she left out was, you had dogs sent on you. You had fire hoses turned on you. Just so that you could have access to the rights and all of the amenities that we should have as American citizens, right? So, what was it that motivated people like my mom and my dad to start the civil rights movement, to be willing to have gas shot at them, to be willing to have dogs sick on them, to be willing to be kicked out of places? What was the motivation? Future. Future? Legacy? Excellent. What else? Opportunity. Opportunity. Safety, thank you, we're gonna come back to that too. Anger. Anger. Hope. Faith. Hope, faith. The answer I actually gave my mother specifically was, mom, you were right, and we're soft because we didn't have the circumstances you had. You literally grew up around a bunch of people who decided that potentially dying was better than spending another day alive as a less than citizen. I don't have that gift of desperation because you raised me in a house where none of that exists, where I have white friends that don't understand any of the things that you're talking about. I don't have that struggle. And there's good and bad that comes with that. Because right, I don't have the grit that my parents had, but I also don't live in the environment they had to live in. It's an interesting thing that you get really motivated when you have outside circumstances pushing on you. Right, now I promised Emily I would keep this PG-13 for this last story. So I want you to, again, so you pictured yourself as my mom. Hopefully in that story you didn't picture yourself as me. I'm a bad host if you did. I want you to picture now you're a brand new, what's called first lieutenant, okay? So you've come into the Army, you've been promoted once. So now you've gone from being in charge as a 23-year-old young man from being in charge of a group of about nine people, now you're in charge of 50 and you're in what we now call, federal folks will understand, the National Training Center out in California. You're on an incredibly long convoy which is designed to make you tired and fatigued and not give you food and basically beat you down so that when you actually get to combat, you're used to the hardship. This young, now first lieutenant, who's getting his real First experience is what we call a platoon leader, Marines will call it a platoon commander. Gets dysentery on the convoy. So picture you're in the desert, laying in the back of the Humvee with all the gear, Humvee's the big truck that we used to drive in. Now they're out MRAPs and striker vehicles, all the stuff's changed. I was in the Army a long time ago. You get dysentery, and all of a sudden, you feel a rumbling in your stomach. And you know that you are not going to make the rest of this convoy, but to stop the convoy is to stop the mission. Okay? So in the back of your mind, you're like, I gotta get out of this convoy because I've gotta go take care of business. <laughs> Otherwise, you can forget about everybody's gear that you're laying in the back of the Humvee room. Okay? PG-13, So as this new first lieutenant, you're thinking through I'm gonna stop this convoy, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have to explain to the team to include the second in command of this unit. Why are you stopping my convoy, right? So, he very stealthily called that nine-man group that used to be in charge of and say, hey, have the toilet chair ready. And, and yes, we had a chair that had a toilet seat welded onto it and a hole cut in it. And the toilet paper. Convoy stops. Of course, the second in charge is now angry because we're holding him. You can't be late in the army. People die when you're late. He comes running out of his vehicle. Sir, what in the hell are you doing stopping the convoy? Now, some context I left out. You are known in the unit as the young Christian gentleman 
who goes around reading his Bible and telling everybody all these wonderful stories about hope and faith and you're pure and you're the good guy, right? So they, the, the unit has this image of you that you're kind of an upstanding, do the right thing, keep it positive guy. But you realize that in order to stop this convoy and be effective, you're going to have to do something to disrupt the pattern. So, as the young first lieutenant, when the first sergeant comes up and starts yelling at you, you yell, Top! That's his nickname. I got a shit! <laughs> convoy stops. You know the end of the story. If you hadn't put together, this was me that this happened to. But, all humor and silliness aside, What's the motivation for someone to potentially not go against, but even compromise this image of the pure person in the unit? What's the motivation of that person to take an action that is potentially going to be offensive to people, but certainly going to get their attention? And maybe even diminish the view they have you. What's the motivation? Desperation. Desperation. Yep. <laughs> The good of the team. Good of the team, kind of. <laughs> and I can always say that because I'm the guy in the story, right? Having the mission succeed. What was that? Having the mission succeed. Exactly. What else? What's my motivation for telling you a story that could potentially offend you? Honesty. Honesty. Authenticity. What else? To disrupt the pattern, to help you understand that in every one of these scenarios, motivation wasn't the problem. So if motivation is not the problem, we have to diagnose, okay, what is the problem? Because motivation, like we said, motivation is still important. There's something that underlies motivation that kicks that in for us, right? And so How many people saw Chris talk on stage yesterday, Chris Armstrong, when he talked about doing the studies that led to six different things that were all the same across all the organizations when it came to issues of culture, right? So I have six things that I want to share with all of you. That if we don't get these right, you can forget about motivating people, you can forget about having awards programs that make people feel good about themselves. If we don't get these things right, if we don't understand at a very basic level what and who we are as human beings, and we don't have enough empathy to work around that, you can forget about going back and motivating your team, motivating the individuals who aren't motivated, and most importantly, motivating yourself. Because you'll see when I get to the end, that's what starts. Okay, so six things, and I'm gonna give you a bonus seven. First and foremost, and how many of y'all are familiar with Abraham Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy? As I'm going to be stealing a little bit of what he's saying, but add some to it. So, if we were to rank all of the human needs that we have, so let's forget about motivation for a second and understand that as humans, every action we take, good or bad, if you define what that means to you, is based upon a perceived human need that we have. Period. What do you think the first need is? And if you've read the hierarchy, you may already know. Anybody? Safety. Safety. Excellent. So if you're a note taker, I like to use security or certainty is a good way to say it. Every human soul has a need for it, an amount of certainty in their life. Okay? I need to wake up every day and know that gravity's not gonna stop working. Otherwise, this is gonna get really interesting very quickly. Right? What do you think the second one is? Love, it's a good one. Sense of belonging. Sense of belonging. Are you talking about Maslow's hierarchy or her? Kind of. So it, this is. Like, so if you want to. Right, so phys the physical needs is this first one, and then safety is the second one. So ours, is, this one is a little bit different. So okay. this is what do you think is next? So if you say Maslow's, it's not going to be exactly right. But you'll get some of them. So variety. Let me just give you the answer without teasing it out. And in parentheses, put adventure. 
We have a need for security, but the opposite, or at least the complement of that, is we also have a need for adventure as people. Next, significance. And you can put in parentheses, being unique. We have a need to know that we matter. Do you guys agree with that? Is this fair so far? Okay. Four, someone mentioned love. I didn't see her name tag, but she mentioned love. Four is love. Now let's not mistake that or conflate that with just like romantic love, kind of the Hollywood thing, but the human connection. The need we have to be important to another human being and to be connected to them. Uh, said significance. Number five is growth. Because you all know from biology, if you're not growing, you're in atrophy, which means another word for you, we're dying. We either grow or we die. That's humanity. So we have a need, and I'm stressing the word need. This isn't desires, this isn't nice to have. These are human needs that we have. And as leaders, if you don't get these right, you can forget about motivating your team or your individuals or yourself. Last need in the six, and then I'll give you the bonus, is contribution. You've always heard about giving back. Right? In the military, you, hope you, you're, you, will, you will hear people talk about selfless service, personal courage, leaving things better than you can. We all have a need to contribute. Now, here's the catch. All six of those things are in order. And if you don't have the one before the next one, you can forget about getting to the next one. If you don't have security, if you don't know where you're getting food from tonight, I can guarantee you, regardless of what your value system is, <laughs> what can motivate you, you're not going to be worried about contributing to the people in this room. You're going to be worried about how do I feed myself. And you're going to take actions, possibly even actions that go against your values. So I told you the story about me yelling at my first sergeant. Now, I don't have a problem with language. I teach my kids that there are no bad words. It's how we use them. But I knew that, right? I wasn't thinking about contributing, I was thinking about how do I get out of this very survival physical situation. That was the motivation. And so when you understand that these go in order, now you understand that if you don't meet these needs for your people, forget about motivating them. Because you're not going to. The other piece to this is you have to understand that different individuals value some of these different than others. Because I imagine everyone in this room will agree that you have some taste of all sick. Fair? That you have some semblance of security for Americans, so we're not allowed to say we don't have security. Right? At least to some degree. Right? I've been in way worse places. Right? We do have some sort of variety. And once you get past that subsistence living, you're talking about the physiological needs and the safety, once you get those fixed, then it gets a little okay. Which one of these do I value most because I've got my basic needs met? Fair? Number seven, leave it blank. Because this is for you. What's the need that you have outside of these six? Think about that. You don't have to answer it, you don't have to call it out. But I want you to put some thought to what is the thing that you need that's important specifically to you. Now it could be one of the six or it could be something that you add to it, okay? I'll stress again, if we do not get these six needs met, people are gonna take actions that potentially go against their value and they're certainly not going to work with you on the things you're trying to motivate them to do. How many have heard the term, if we could just get the team to agree on a single goal and everybody's working together toward a goal that we agree on is the right goal, we'll have all the motivation we need to be successful. You worked on a team where that's been the truth, show of hands. Right? If we can just get a goal that everyone agrees is the goal, everyone will just naturally work together. Okay? If you've taken a game theory class, you know that is scientifically false. What every one of us does, myself included, is you can put a goal on the table. You can say, here's the goal, everybody, do we all agree? And they're going to nod their head because they want to get a paycheck or they want whatever thing they're getting from you, right? But every human soul is only going to work toward this goal till they get whatever their need net is. 
So we have some unrealistic expectations about, I talked to a business owner recently that I help as a client, they're like, I want my people to be as motivated as me when they come to work. Never gonna happen. <laughs> Never gonna happen. It's not their vision, it's yours. Now they're gonna be motivated to a degree. What you have to do, and this is what I told her, as the leader of the organization, you have to know what, motive, what their need is. And you meet that and you over deliver on it, and then you'll have what's called loyalty, and they'll help you get to your goal. But until you go first and meet their need, you can forget about it. Next, if you're a note taker, let's talk about what I call the four M's of motivation. So not only do we have to know that these six things have to be met to some degree, not only do we know that people value different ones, and you're thinking at this time, okay, which one do I value? Like, am I a security guy? I used to hunt people all over the world. Security is not usually my first thing. You know, adventure matters more to me, right? Because I have some semblance. If I had no security, that wouldn't be true, okay? The four ends of motivation. And think about this selfishly. Think about what motivates you. Because if we can't get you squared away, forget about the team. Material, okay, so that's money, that's things. Which, by the way, add no negative connotation to that. We live in a society that vilifies people for being materialistic. I'm cool with you being materialistic as long as it helps somebody and it doesn't hurt anybody. Okay? So material. Number two, mastery. How many in here, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to out yourself. You have career ambitions that you want to get to a certain level. You want to have a certain level of significance. You want your name to be on the door. That's mastery, right? Okay, that's mastery, right? It's also tied to significance in the needs column, right? Three, momentum. Parentheses, freedom. Four, mating, and we had to make it an M, so mating is what we came up with for human interaction. Okay, it's not the literal <laughs> definition of mating, okay? But you can't, by the way, it can be. Let's be clear. Okay. So, what we need to understand is, these are the four, and you can add probably 20 things to this list. I like these four. Because if you can figure out these four for yourself, where are my mastery folks at? And by the way, I'm, I'm asking you to rank them. Where, who has mastery as their number one thing? Like, I want to be important. Not in an arrogant, self-serving way, but in a way where you're in a position to give back and contribute. Mastery, right? Who are my money folks? Material. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> Almost nobody raises their hand when I do this. Excellent. Okay. Good. Where's my momentum and freedom people? I'm going to keep my hand up. Okay? Now remember, mating is not just a liberal term, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mating is human interaction, connection. I don't want to be a part of a team. I want to have cheese parties every day in the office. <laughs> All right? One more cake party. Right? My master people don't give a crap about the cheese party. Brother. Okay? And the reason why I ask you to pay attention to that for you is because you have to know how to reward yourself. Because if you can't do it for you, you can't do it for your team. And that's why I say thank you for being honest about the material one. Because you'll know that if money or some material, maybe it's a house, maybe it's a car, maybe it's, I don't know, you fill in the blank thing you want, then you know to make that the thing that's going to motivate you. Right? Again, motivation isn't our problem. It's not our problem. Our problem is we don't know how to meet the basic human needs, one, two, we don't know what the basic human need the person we're dealing with values most. And we don't even personally know what motivates us specifically until someone gives you a quiz on it. Right? And if anybody in the room is questioning which one of those four you are, give yourself a test. If I was going to hire, let's, let's do money versus momentum, right? Money versus freedom. If I was going to ask you to come work in my company for 10 years, you can't quit ever. But at the end of the 10 years, you're going to have $10 million in your bank account. Right? But here's the catch. You are going to hate every day of your life working for me. Every day you're going to go home like that. I need a drink. Please, this dude. He talks all the time. He never stops talking. He's big headed. Or I'll pay you 100000 bucks a year and you'll love every day of your job. OK, 
okay, let's make it $45,000. So, the reason why we do that is I want to tease that out. I want to know that she may be more motivated by material, so she's the person who could potentially take the job that pays more, but comes with a level of stress that a momentum person, a freedom person, would never put up with because they feel stifled. Right? They'll go take the $45,000 a day job because they wake up every day and the people <coughs> that you've given your life as a momentum person is that freedom means something to me. It's a part of my identity. Right? Thank you. Awesome. So, and then the seventh one is blank. Tying these all together, the reason why I had you all put yourselves in the shoes of the people, Chris, my mother, and then me, is if you can't get you motivated, forget about your team. And it starts with empathy, understanding what those basic needs are. Right? I train a lot of people physically in the gym. And inevitably, I'll get people that say, I'm just not motivated to go to the gym. I said, what if you walked out of your apartment tonight and I unleashed, I don't know why I have one, a bear. <laughs> <laughs> to chase you down the street, would you run? Yeah. Would you what? For my safety. Right, because you don't want to die. Right? And so what I'll tell them is when you want to work out as bad as you don't want to die, you'll have all the motivation you need. We've got to meet needs. And the reason why I had you put yourself in the shoes of the people in the story, especially Chris, with everything that he went through, by the way, the end of that story is he gets teased by some of his peers because he has to drink to go to bed every night because he knows he was three inches away from having the back of his head taken off. He's still in the military and he's still serving. That goes beyond motivation. Why? Because he has a need to contribute. He has watched friends die on the battlefield and he's gonna do everything in his power to make sure that that, that, that doesn't happen again. And friends, that motivates him in ways that go beyond Weight Watchers or Slim Fast or whatever other thing that we're trying to add to our lives to motivate us. It's not motivation, right? And you have to go first. You have a person on your team that's not motivated, figure out what need they're missing. How do you do it? Ask them. What need do you have here that's not being met? Is it security? Is it you're afraid that you're gonna lose your job? Figure out how to make them not feel that anymore. Is it that they're not able to contribute? With their specific skill set, Struther talked about that. I don't know how many of you guys were in Struther's awesome talk today. Yeah. Stuff that you have to be able to give to who you are. If, you, if contribution is a thing that matters to you, then you have to be able, especially for those of you in here who are supervisors, I'm really looking at y'all. Show of hands. Okay? You're the first line of defense in making sure that your people have their needs met. Then going the extra mile and understanding what their specific motivations are. Ask, have the conversations. I'm introverted is not an excuse, <laughs> all right? Because I'll tell you what introversion actually is. We use that as, no, we're not gonna be, has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with where you get your energy, okay? And we can suck it up and do what's necessary for our people, right? We gotta sweat a little bit if we want our people to be motivated. And we have to go first by first motivating ourselves and then understanding the needs that our people have so that we can meet those needs, understanding the motivations that sit on top of that so that we can help them get there. Thank you so much. What are your questions? <coughs> yes, ma'am. If someone is motivated by a sense of morality, where does that fit in those four ends? For example, someone might be motivated by what they want to see um, as far as justice goes, fixing the situation, to make sure that something is done right in terms of morality. Where does that fit in? Excellent question. I would put that in between mastery and momentum. It is in order to have the freedom to affect the positive change that they want to see, they're going to have to have some agency, some freedom built into what they do. And in order to actually be effective at a small or larger scale, they're going to have
Um, we, in our region, we have five county health departments, and in the two and a half years that I've been there, we've gone from a workforce of 160 to 59. And so, um, with federal funding getting slashed, state funding getting slashed, um, you know, a large portion is just that we've lost employees because of their lack of faith in the agency and the broad hiring increase. So we have people that are doing three and four people jobs, um, but when we sit in meetings and we're trying to, you know, have that motivation, we have amazing leadership that's currently stepped in um, to fix situations and you know, we are the health department. We have essential services. Some of our smaller communities don't even have a doctor's office. So it's literally the place where people can go and get help. Um, and it's affecting our communities terribly. And so it's not just motivating my team of three, <laughs> which is an awesome team of three. It's motivating local agency. And I think it's the safety part. I mean, people are worried about their jobs. They're worried about their income. What do, you, what type of advice would you give us to, you know, re-motivate? So before I give advice, I'd ask a couple of questions. I'd do a discovery meeting, right? Yeah. When you say you have great leaders who are stepping in to help out, how dirty are their hands? Are they in the trenches with the people who are now taking up the three jobs? Are they rolling so up from the commissioner to first year leadership, they're all gone. <coughs> so. Um, and that's at the state level. At the local level, I mean, we're all, um, our leadership is still there, but they did the best with what they have. Um, I think they're very untrusting of the new leadership. I am The workforce is untrusting of the new leadership. Absolutely. Okay. Government. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm tracking, I'm tracking. And so, if we're not trusting the leadership, yeah. that leads me to believe that the leadership is not bought in to, us, to helping with the motivational issues that you have there. Is that a fair assumption? You're still cleaning up the mess. Or right. So. so what I would say, do you have the leadership here? Some of the leadership here. Mm -hmm. All those are legislators that are budgeting and doing things as well. It's a big issue. Absolutely. Yeah. So the leadership that you have, though, is it visible to the workforce that they're actually getting in the trenches to help with the problems that you're having? Specifically, the fact that you went from you're, you've been cut basically more than in half, right? Does the workforce see them as coming and getting a shovel and helping us pick up the mess, or are they so busy managing up that the workforce doesn't need to see that? I don't know. I think some people may see it. So the first thing I would want for like, so if I'm in charge of all the leadership core. Is roll your sleeves up and show your people that you're dedicated to helping them do the parts that now we've lost help. So guess what, CEO? You're now digging ditches. Right? Suck it up and get it done if we want to have that level of trust. Because people are going to trust you when they know that you're going to be on one accord with them and that you're going to help them and not leave them high and dry. Right? I would probably dedicate one person to being a spinning wheel to go get more money. Right? Start beating down doors, rioting, whatever it is, joking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it, it's a unique situation where there's not one solution that's gonna fix that problem. What I would tell you specifically is in your sphere of influence, be, model what you actually wanna see in other people. Show them that you're sweating. Show them that you're bleeding in the trenches with them. Because that's what's gonna make them trust you. Because no matter how bad it gets, what was your name, I'm sorry? Michelle. Michelle is here with us every day sweating it out. I think for me, it's like it's gotten worse and worse and worse, which motivates me more and more and more. So I haven't figured out what I am there yet, but you know I don't I don't understand the lack of motivation, which is very frustrating for me. Which is a great point, which goes back to the empathy piece. Yeah. Your need very much sounds like contribution. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. Right? That's kind of the one that that's the value that's driving you. Mm -hmm. You may be around a lot of people that are driven by security. Those two things do not always get along. So people who are all security are like, give me the marbles, and go, nope. The person who's adventurous and wanting to contribute is the person that's out there willing to put their back on the line. Right? So you may not just have an issue with motivation, you may have a values issue, where you have a certain set of core values that drive your action. And the reason why it's hard to see why other people aren't motivated is you need to add that energy piece too. I 
get it. This person just isn't me. They didn't have my parents. They didn't have my experiences. Empathy, empathy, empathy is the answer to that. Meet them where they are. Help them meet their need in any way you can in your sphere of influence, and that's what's going to build the trust and rapport. Okay. Yes, sir. So how would you go about motivating a team when you don't actually have the authority or ability to help them meet some of these needs? Kind of like security or something, if you are in a place where there's coming layoffs and you have no ability to actually affect that, how do you actually be able to get that stability for your team so that you can you know, progress? So specifically we're focusing on the security, the, the security, <coughs> the secure, I'm sorry, when you said security, I started thinking about security forces. The security needs. You don't have the ability to make sure people don't lose their jobs. Right? But you do have the ability. It's, it's reframing. So you have a sphere of influence that only goes so far. Find somewhere in your sphere of influence where you can create a level of safety. Maybe it's just being the brother that's going to stand like, no matter what goes down, I've got you back. Even if this ends the way we don't want it to end. I'm going to be here every day showing up to make sure. And if you get laid off, bro, I'll come help you. I'll cook you meals. Right? It's whatever you can do in your sphere of influence to help someone who's security focused to put them at ease. No, you can't guarantee them that their job's still gonna be there. Most of us probably can't. I mean, I can't even do that with my employees. Like if all my clients wake up tomorrow and say, we're done, I'm like, we're done. <laughs> right? But I can tell them that no matter what happens, we're all gonna, we're all gonna be in this trench together and we're gonna figure it out, right? It's about giving them a sense that Really, a lot of this stuff is just showing your people that you, you care at all the levels, right? So it's, you operate in the sphere of where you actually have some level of control and some level of agency you may have. And it's going to take some creative thinking. You're going to have to creatively think through, okay, can't do this, but what can I do? And bring in help. You know, they were talking about earlier today um, who likes to come up with ideas in a group or who likes to do them alone. Never do them alone. Be a plagiarist. Bring other people around you. That's what I was going to say if you called me. I'm a plagiarist. I'm, I have no good ideas. I read books of old dead people. I'm like, that's going to work? Because history's proven it, right? Bring people into the team that can help you figure those things out so you don't have to do it all yourself. Yes, ma'am. How do you motivate people in a team, in a volunteer team? Um, they feel like vision and you have got to be a master at recruiting the right people and understanding why they volunteered in the first place. Right? So if someone's going to come work for me as an intern, the first question I'm going to ask them is if you had 10 years to live, would you still want to come intern with me? And when they say yes, they have to say yes. That means they know my vision, they know where I'm going, they know my vision is to reach a billion people with a message that can change lives. That means something. Right? That's why there's a hitch to my wagon. So part of that is how you attract the people that are going to come volunteer. Inevitably, you're going to get the people that are there maybe for different reasons than your vision. You as the leader have to figure out why you're actually here. And sometimes that's a literal conversation, like, why did you decide to volunteer here? And don't accept the first answer. Usually you have to ask people why three to seven times before they say, oh, because it looks good on my resume, or oh, because my mother made me come here. Great. <laughs> So I'm going to call your mom if you don't come up here and do this stuff and tell her that you're not pulling your weight. You see what I mean? So part of it is make sure you're attracting the right people to the vision that you have, and you have to be a good storyteller. You know, I want to reach a billion people to change lives. That sounds like for people who care about contribution, they're all that. But I have to tell a good story, and I have to make it believable, right? So get that piece right so that the folks that are coming in to volunteer are the right people. Part of it too is knowing you don't have the right person on the team. Just tell them, look. The real, I'm not sure why you're here, but maybe you're not the right fit for where we're trying to go. And it's okay. You know, it's like in, in my line of work, sometimes I have to fire a client. As I said, this relationship isn't going to work out. We're not going to the same direction. Is that fair? Awesome. Yes, sir. In the back. What do you feel the difference is between motivating and inspiring? Or is there? So I think inspiration is a hard issue. You know, go back to the example that I gave. My, that was actually a real story of my best friend. It can never work out because he's not motivated and I'm going to make a bear chase him. You can create outside circumstances, positive or negative, that 
and motivates a person, but it doesn't get to the heart. It doesn't get to their beliefs. It doesn't get to their identity. Meaning he'll go to the gym and he'll run as long as the bear is chasing me. And that's why I say the problem's not motivation, because motivation is temporary. And I can get into neurology and the glycogen in your brain won't bore you with all that stuff. Motivation is very temporary. It's inspiration is that what's that fire that I lit underneath your soul that keeps you helping airborne rangers who have broken legs when you have a bullet through your face. That's where the inspiration comes from. Chris was inspired from friends that he lost in battle prior to that point to continue saving lives. That's going to keep him in the fight when motivation is gone. How many of you have gone to the gym when you didn't feel like it? Everybody. Where was your motivation? You had zero motivation. No. The motivation was I'm going to have to look at myself in the mirror a little bit. Right? But not to make light of your question, the inspiration is that, it's that soulish thing. And so going back to the needs, I'm glad you asked that. Those two top needs, growth and contribution, those are spiritual needs. Right? You don't get the spiritual needs before you fix all the other physiological and psychological needs. Is that fair? Awesome. Yes, ma'am. So, thank you, because I've been wanting to say this. I was going to say that my, sometimes no solution is the solution. Sometimes it just is what it is, and I know that's not the right answer you want to hear. If someone is at the end of their rope, like if I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and I, I don't have that intestinal fortitude, the kid, what was your name, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, Sam. Sam and I, if he doesn't have that intestinal fortitude to get up every day and care about it, Sometimes, I mean, you can find what their needs are, you can, you can figure out the things that motivate them, but the return on investment may be marginal. It's like I see a lot of government agencies train their seniors. I'm like, let them die. They'll be gone in a few years. Like, they already ruined this place. Train your new people. You know, it's something that a lot of times civilian government, state, federal, doesn't matter, can learn from the military. From the time you, were, you hit basic training, they are investing millions of dollars into making you awesome, right? So sometimes when it's that light at the end of the tunnel person, and I had an employee, he was, he was my deputy director of security once upon a time when I was the chief operations officer for Union Station downtown. He's like, Brian, I just wanna go watch the kids play baseball. And I'm like, Greg, you need to go watch your kids play baseball. Like, let's figure out how we get you somewhere else that's not a terrorist target. <laughs> And let's get someone else in who's hungry and wants to do the thing. So it's, sometimes it could be in the Army we have a joke that either when you get to the end of your career or you're bad at your career, they send you to pass out basketballs at the gym. Maybe you need to send them to pass out basketballs at the gym until they're done. Okay, so that was inappropriate, and that's a ding on your evaluation. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, so all jokes aside, the point is you, you have to know, you have to be able to manage expectations. In some cases, I'm not going to be able to motivate Greg. Like, but but, but his you desire. That. He made that everybody know that he was true. No, never. Never, never. Never, never. Not, and so I'm glad you said it because that's not at all my intent. It's more along the lines of. You know, the people that she's talking about specifically. There's no, there's no bay. Yes, ma'am. So, so hold, hold on, before I leave, before you go, I want to make sure. Was there anything else, question or otherwise, that you guys want me to address, just to be clear? I'm not wholesaling saying that your seniors are just a lost cause. She said they were a problem. Huh? She said they were a problem. But she's talking about a specific subset of people. So that's the assumption I went in in our conversation. And so I wanted to preface with manage your expectations to the degree that, and by the way, this applies to the young people too. The old people, the young people, I don't care. Some people, you're just not going to get through to them. And it's about accepting that if I've told you that I just want to go watch my kids play baseball, 
then as the leader, I need to empathetically figure out, okay, how do I help you do that without hurting your family, right? How do I help you ride off into the sunset in a way that's beneficial to you, but also doesn't hurt the company? And how do I find someone that can potentially come in and make the change that you're talking about? And those are honest, real conversations that you can have with your staff. So apologies, I'm glad you brought that up because if anyone else felt the same way as she did, by no means is this a wholesale statement. And age is irrelevant, 100%. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll come, Amelia, and then I'll come to you. Yes, ma'am. So, in some ways, what I'm gonna ask is, is piggybacking off of that. What I'm curious about is, all right, so I need to know what motivates me. Yeah. I need to inspire myself, and then I need to be the case setter for the people around me. Right. Because you lead by example, do the thing, people will follow, or, or they won't. You know, right. they'll, they'll come with me, we'll be a team, or they won't, and if they're not, we'll find ways to deal with that. But I think part of that for me is also, this is where I get to the issue of, I, I'm gonna kind of call it hope, but what do you do when everything feels broken? When the bureaucracy is getting in the way, when the politics are getting in the way, not just like government level politics, whatever, whether you agree or not, no, we can't talk about it. But also, like the, the interpersonal office politics, the, what do you do when the ego gets in the way? I think part of it is that it's really hard to have that day-to-day -day feeling. And I, I know for me that when I think about some of the leaders at my agency, and I'm not thinking just like high-level SES leaders, I'm not thinking you know people who have retired in place, I'm thinking of people who are mentally not feeling that engagement when the environment around you is so, oh, I'll just sum up with awful, and I'm sure there are other words that we could use too. A toxic is a good one. But like when you do that, how do you, I mean, yes, that yes, we have to inspire ourselves, it's on us, but like, really, man, it's hard every day, dude. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Though cheese parties does sound like a good idea. I'm down with that. By the way, cheese parties is a great idea. But part of, part of the reason why we find ourselves in these situations where we think it's awful or it's toxic is because that's the story we keep telling ourselves over and over again, right? And by the way, as humans, going back to the science piece, your brain is a survival machine. It is designed to keep you alive, not to make you happy. So it's wired to find the things that are negative in your environment. It's just part of being a human being. In your specific situation, what I would be looking for is where do we have the positives? Where do we have some semblance of the good that we can focus on and then begin to create another narrative? Because that narrative becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Chris talked about that on stage last night where he said it's not the leadership who are the problem. A lot of times it's just the stories we continue to tell ourselves, it's broken, it's this, it's that. Tell yourself a different story, right? And this is something that, uh, going back to the military analogy, is that a lot of military folks um, are trained from the beginning that if you've ever worked in SWAT, even not military, law enforcement, if you work with SWAT or special forces, they have a saying that says, never let a loser leave the battlefield. Meaning when you're training, they're going to beat the crap out of you but they're gonna let you win the fight in the training exercise. And that's the thing is we negatively story tell so much that there's no room, it almost becomes learned helplessness. So the people who are aware of it and yourself aware of the awful, you have to start creating another narrative. And it's not just in the way we talk, friends, that's like 8% of it. It's in the way we act around other people. It's about being willing to be honest with other people and caring about other people's needs and desires, right? That's, and that's exactly what you and I were talking about. But sometimes you just have to accept that no solution is the solution. Yes, ma'am. You were next. That's her reality, and I want to be respectful of that. 
and we'll apologize for that and we'll figure out how do I say it better next time so I don't put you in a situation where I made you feel uncomfortable. Fair? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Procrastinators. That is the. My, I know what I'm motivated by, and it's like meeting deadlines well ahead of time so you have time to retool if you need to. We have some procrastinators, and I'm not in charge of them, but I'm forced to be on teams with them. It makes me crazy. Okay, so real easy. This is, this is an easy one. Procrastination is usually your mind trying to tell you you're doing the wrong thing. So what you need to evaluate is, not always, sometimes people are just procrastinators, but what you need to evaluate is you, if you have a procrastinator on your team, psychologically, it's probably them not even being aware of it, telling you I'm in the wrong job. Or you have me doing the wrong things in the job that I'm in. Figure out how can I find a way to help this person contribute in a way that's unique to them, right? I had a person who we had answering phones downtown who used to cuss out our clients. You're an idiot, I hate all of you, and I'm not exaggerating. I came in and was like, put her in marketing, she's creative, <laughs> overnight, overnight, I'm not lying. The vice president came by, that was genius, how'd you come up with that? I said, well, I got tired of getting phone calls from everybody outside of our phone person calling people idiots. But she came alive in that gig because she was also very good at it, she had a lot of passion for it. Right? So it's about evaluating, do you have your team members doing the right things? And that's what Struther was talking about this morning. Yes, ma'am. So to follow up on that and Struther's presentation, one of the things that he talked about was, you know, there are some people that like to plan ahead and kind of be done well in advance, and others that work the best in kind of like a high stress, <coughs> situation. So how does that mirror with procrastination? So we're going to talk about the people on this wall of the procrastinators. Yeah. Yes. So. I would just, I would have you reframe that a little bit the way you're looking at it, because it may not be that they're procrastinators, it may be that their willingness to incur risk is higher than yours. And so what I mean by that is, the things that you're seeing over here in the planning phase that are highly important, if we don't get these things done, the sky is falling, they may not agree. So then, to follow that up, right. would you be able to say that, theoretically, none of these people are procrastinators, it's just how someone who is, you know, planning and kind of thoughtful in that way, sees them? Or no, it's like, I'm straight up procrastinating. Sometimes people procrastinate, but it often comes down to, am I working on the thing? Like, so for example, all of us tend to procrastinate. If you have a to-do list, do you do the hardest thing first, or do you kind of put that off and knock off easy? All of us would agree to do that unless you've been trained otherwise. And that procrastination is because I get, my, my emotional self gets pain out of having to tackle this very hard thing. So sometimes procrastination is just, I got a really daunting thing that makes me feel pain, like going to the gym and running seven miles on the treadmill. I'm gonna procrastinate on that, I'm gonna focus on what people call the working <coughs> a lot of times. Right, so the answer is it's nuanced. There's no black and white to that. Yes, sir. So kind of going along that same thing, I was always a procrastinator for growing up and stuff. And one thing that I realized, it, for me, I actually work better in little bursts and I like to plan so far ahead, but actually doing the work, like I have to sit down and I won't eat or anything. I won't leave the chair for 12 solid hours sometimes, and I will keep working on something. Right. So I kind of actually work better when I'm just cramming and focusing on nothing other than that. And what I realized worked really well for me was I set strict deadlines on myself, and people at Procrast Day, sometimes it's good to give them like early deadlines that, okay, yeah, you don't need to get it done in this month, but I want it done by next week. And there was also, if you kind of follow like a one, three, five rule, where it's like, I'm gonna do one big thing today or this week, three medium things and five small things, sometimes tasking those people out saying, hey, I need these three small things or whatever done by this Friday, and by the end of this month, I really need this one done. That seems to, you know, it's still frustrating because you want to see that constant progress. And I'm not the boss, that's the problem too. Uh, right. Yeah. And we keep getting thrust to, you know. And then, they, then when they turn it in, it's lousy. So we end up doing it anyhow because we have to meet the deadline. And when they hand this crap in because they run out of time, we yes, have to yeah. fix it. 
and that's I'm a perfectionist procrastinator. <laughs> so when I turn something in, it's it has to be perfect. And one question for you was uh, so hold, hold that one because I think are we up on the break? So I want to be respectful to folks that don't want to stick around, but if you have questions, I will stay as long as you need. Sorry. No, no worries, no worries. Go ahead. So when you were kind of talking about volunteer management, <laughs> when you're looking at somebody that is just getting one step and on their resume, I have an issue. I have an issue basically with people that all they want to do is say they're a part of the team or they want to actually help out with it, but at the same time, they can't just say, 